If you go outside at night and look up in the sky, um, you don't see just black. Um, if you went to outside and looked up in Pasco and looked west, you would see this in the sky. Dots of light. And if you turned to your right and kept looking up in the sky, you would see these dots of light. What we've been talking about in the class is that each of these dots of light is a star. Inside those stars, an incredible reaction called fusion is producing light. And that light is coming to us. The program that I'm using right now is called Stellarium. And Stellarium can do interesting things with the night view. It can zoom out where I can see more of the sky at once. And I can pretend that I'm laying on my back with my head towards the west. This view from Pasco is not the same as the view from Cerros de Pasco, the city in Peru. Each point of the earth sees a different part of the sky limited by the horizon. Even at night there's a horizon. And as I turn and spin around at night and look up at the sky, I see um, these dots of light. I see the Milky Way, our galaxy, this kind of fuzzy band of white, a bunch of other stars which if I could zoom in, you could see each one in detail. And you can with telescopes, but with your naked eye, you can't see much. The benefit of using a program is that you get these little words, <laughs> so you can see labels of stars. And I think uh, over time you'll also see little wisps of light go by, which are satellites. Another artist, Eleanor Lutz, has uh, made a picture of the night sky, and here's how she describes it. This map shows every single star visible from Earth on the darkest night with the clearest sky. The map also includes all of the brightest galaxies, nebulae, and star clusters. There's a bunch of other information in this graph, or this picture. And let me show you what happens if you zoom in. If you zoom in on her picture, she's not only put the names of certain significant stars, but she's also put lines around the constellations. Right now I'm showing Virgo, Leo, and Cancer. Those are signs of the zodiac, named for um, parts of the sky where the sun would be if you could see stars during the daytime. For those of you born in uh, in June, um, like Mr. Weisenfeld, your uh, the sun was in the constellation Cancer when you were born in June. And as the sun moves through the sky, I think it goes Cancer, Leo, Virgo. There's 
there's a lot of work and detail in this diagram. And it's all um, made from data. Every star that scientists and others can see in the sky from wherever you are on Earth is in this chart. But that's just the visible stars, of course, and visible um, to the naked eye, let's say. Here's a little bit of a zoom in that, um, that she provides. A lot of these symbols and words, of course, and connecting lines, those are things that people who've looked up in the sky have agreed on. Um, it's definitely linked to culture, that when we look in this part of the sky, people have traditionally seen a crab. Cancer, the word for crab in, um, in Latin. And then also these names for stars. Um, we've agreed on which names we give certain stars. And then we have group stars or these other symbols for how bright they are. When you look at this diagram, which is kind of an ideal night with your best eyes, what you notice is that some stars are bigger than the others. They're all in different locations. Some stars have different colors. And uh, some stars appear to be bigger. So color, um, size, location, um, those are all illustrated in this drawing. What I wanted to show, or um, to use all of those pictures by way of introduction, was something in astronomy called the, the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So um, if you click on the link I gave you, what you'll see is this diagram. And what scientists have done is they've taken every star that you can see. Uh, they've linked them, uh, they've grouped them or arranged them by brightness and then by temperature. And in fact, uh, that's what this graph is showing right here. So let me, uh, let me show you or highlight what we're seeing. What we're talking about right now is called an HR diagram or Hertzsprung-Russell. Sometimes people write it H-R diagram. Along the vertical axis here, you're seeing a representation of the brightness of the star. So um, not all stars have the same brightness. And when it comes to astronomy, the word astronomers use is called magnitude and one way to organize magnitude is to think about how bright the star would look uh, from a certain place. Remember stars are closer or farther and remember that lights seem brighter or dimmer based on how far away they are. So imagine that if you could go the same distance from every star what kind of brightness you would see. That's what absolute magnitude is getting at. The other dimension here along the y-axis is, sorry, the x-axis is um, temperature in Kelvin, so that's uh, absolute temperature scale. And one thing that you might notice, of course, if you're familiar with graphs, is that these are the large numbers on the left, and these are the smaller numbers on the right. That's a little bit backwards from what we're used to. 
but astronomers have found it uh, very useful just to look at it that way. It turns out that the temperature of a star can be linked to its color. So if you click this uh, little two arrows here, you'll see something. You'll see the x-axis change to something called spectral type. And spectral type says that, um, or there are letters for each spectral type, O, B, A, F, G, K, M. As, um, as astronomers were classifying stars, it turns out um, they used the letters A through at least O and assigned each star a spectral type. As astronomy, as astronomers understood more about the stars, it turns out the spectral types were linked to the temperature of the star. And it turns out that the order, alphabetical order, didn't really apply. Uh, over time, scientists have developed a quaint way of remembering the order of these um, spectral types. And it says, uh, and the little saying goes like this, O, B, A, fine girl or guy, G, and kiss me. O, B, A, F, G, K, M, the spectral types of stars which are linked to their temperatures. On the y-axis, if you click uh, the arrows, you also get um, an indication of the luminosity of the star, which again is related to brightness. It's just another word, another scale. And what you see is luminosity. If luminosity is a big number, it's a bright star. And if luminosity is a small number, it's a dim star. And this brightness, again, is something that you can look at that's um, it's made irrespective of how far away you are from the star. All right. That's the HR diagram, and we need to point out one more thing, and that's uh, all these words here. Uh, if you take every star in the sky, plot it, uh, its luminosity versus its temperature, then you notice that certain colors, like red, appear over here, and certain uh, brightnesses appear over here or up here in like this upper left region and then certain types of stars appear down here which means very dim stars but very hot stars and the names that we've given to them are shown Super giants, red giants, white dwarfs, and by and large, the vast majority of stars fit along a line that kind of goes like this from lower right to upper left. And uh, astronomers call that the main sequence. In other words, most stars spend most of their time on the main sequence. And our favorite star, the sun, is right about here in the main sequence. Uh, the little red arrow shows you where the, the sun would be. Um, the sun, by definition, has a luminosity of 1. So it's on, like, if you can draw this dotted line over here. And the sun is about a temperature of between 5,000 and 6,000 Kelvin. So again, 
not the coldest star and also not the hottest star in the whole um, universe of stars that we can see. Let's go to the next part of this diagram, which is main stars. Now what we've done, we still have the same luminosity on the vertical axis and temperature on the horizontal axis. But now what the makers of this um, visualization have done is they've showed you some sample stars. So if you click here on our sun, you'll see a zoom in of our sun. And let's look at um, uh, let's look at what we've got for information about our sun. Remember the radius of an object is the distance from the center of the object to the edge of the object. So this is the radius. And we often say radius is r. The age of the star, 4.6 gy. So gy is um, giga years, but giga is more commonly, we call that a billion years. That's 10 to the million years is mega years. That's 10 to the sixth. So this is 10 to the ninth years. MY, you're going to see these as well. MY is mega years, which is a million years. Remember, we're talking about some very long time periods for stars. Next, you'll see the spectral type for the star. Remember, spectral type O, B, A, fine girl or guy, and kiss me. And these are, um, these are the hottest stars. And these are the coolest stars. And so our sun is a G-type star, which is not the coolest and not the hottest. Then remember the colors also, these are blue stars, and these are red stars. The color of a star is linked to its temperature, and the color of a star has been given these um, spectral designations. Here's a little bit more precise information about the temperature of our sun. 5,750 degrees Kelvin, we say, or 507, 5,750, we just say Kelvin. The luminosity of the star, by definition, the sun. So when you see this symbol, a dot with a circle around it, that's the sun. So 1 times the luminosity of the sun means it's as bright as the sun. If you see a number that's 2, L with this dot and circle says luminosity of the sun, then you're looking at something that's twice as luminous as the sun. And you'll also see this symbol when it comes to radius. You'll see r dot with a circle around it. That's the radius of our sun. Remember that luminosity and magnitude uh, are different names for the same idea, the brightness of a star. And absolute magnitude is how the star would look from a certain reference location. And apparent magnitude is how bright the star looks from the Earth. Very useful numbers. And so now, if we take all that information away, all the yellow that I just put there, we can click to the right here and look at other stars. So let me just click on a few. So what you're seeing is the constellation where the star shows up in the sky, which gives you a rough idea where the star is. And then magnitudes luminosities, 
temperatures, spectral types, and age. Again, this means that Sirius A in the constellation Canis Majoris, or the big dog, has a luminosity 25.4 times the luminosity of our sun. And this star is 1.71 times the radius of our sun, so a little bigger than our sun. As you click to the right, you're moving um, in a direction that is uh, turning hotter and hotter. So you should, oh, sorry, cooler and cooler. Actually, what we're looking at as I go left and right is, um, yeah, it's the temperature designations. Or it's the size. As I click and look, I'm seeing um, the size of the star change, the radius of the star change. So as we get bigger and bigger relative to the sun, we may actually be um, hotter than the sun or a different color than the sun, right? Those are linked. And we may also be brighter or dimmer than the sun based on size. So uh, that was clicking to the right, and I think I've gone as far to the right as possible. So this is the largest star um, in this part of the, um, the simulation. So if we go back, and you can go back quite quickly if you drag your mouse left to right. Now, Sirius B is a binary star, so all the way to the left, we're very small relative to our sun. This star, in fact, is also dim relative to our sun, but it is way hotter. And the spectral type doesn't even fit on the O, B, A, F, G, K, M scale. We have our Earth for comparison. The Earth, you know, isn't a star. And if you, uh, if you double click away, so let me click down here again, then um, you click up here to zoom out of this view, then you can um, stop looking at these stars. Here's Jupiter, a planet in our system, not a star. And now, again, we're looking at stars that are um, bigger than our sun. And their brightness and their... So these are all smaller than our sun. And then you'll see our sun go by. So here's our sun. Coming up. I think this is it. Yeah, there we go. There's our sun. And you, uh, if you scroll to the left, there's things smaller than our sun. And if you scroll to the right, there's things larger than our sun. All right, now if you zoom out, um, one way to classify these stars is to look at what their age is. Which are, where are the oldest stars? And uh, what you notice is there are a few stars that go away that are um, not on the main sequence. Remember, uh, this pattern of stars here is called the main sequence. And so when I, um, when I take those away, uh, a lot of these stars up here in the upper right go away. They're not very old. 
and a lot of stars here in the upper left go away. They're not very old. And some stars on the main sequence are not very old either, especially some of the hotter ones and a few of the cooler ones. Remember, this side is hotter and this side is cooler. One last view of the simulation is the evolution of our sun. When I click this button, you'll see a quick animation of how our sun formed. And so let me drag this dot. So I'll click down here on this dot to see that our sun started off, was born from a stellar cloud, a stellar nebula, a cloud of gas that coalesced over time. That means it came together. Gravity increased, and then in the center of our star, fusion was born. The, the time scale here is giga years, so billions of years. So one billion years ago, our sun looked like this, and it has looked basically the same for most of that time. Our sun right now is between 4 and 5 billion years old, and it's going to burn. In other words, it's going to be around for another six to eight billion years. What happens uh, as our sun uses up, remember, it's hydrogen fuel. Um, the dynamics between the core, where that fusion is happening, and the gravity, so the flow of energy out from the center of the star and gravity get in a tug of war. And our star is going to increase in size and get cooler. It's going to increase in brightness. So as the stunt, as we track the age of the sun, it would actually be moving on the HR diagram, which means it's going through stages that increase its brightness, then decrease its temperature, decreasing temperature all the way as the brightness increases. As you get between 10 and 11 billion years, the sun makes a quick increase in temperature, and then it's going to increase dramatically in brightness, and it's going to increase dramatically in temperature, changing color, and at some point uh, it's going to be a stellar nebula. The interior of the star, the core, is going to separate from the outer layers. And then the sun is going to become a white dwarf. And settle in towards the end of its life as a white dwarf down here. Very still, very hot, but very dim, according to its location on the HR diagram. Here is a summary of the stages that our sun is going to go through. And every star is going to track out a path on the HR diagram throughout its lifetime. But the HR diagram itself is a snapshot in time of stars. Uh, and since stars spend most of their time just burning, uh, that's why we have this big main sequence pattern of stars. So that's the HR diagram. That's the uh, the simulation that um, that we're looking at today. Uh, so please take a moment to enjoy or investigate other stars uh, that you might be interested in.